So, as you probably know, I am a child of divorced parents. Uh, my parents divorced when I was very, very young. I'm going to say between a year and two years old. And uh, uh, as you could probably assume, if uh, a marriage breaks up with a child that is that young, uh, it is probably filled with uh, animosity and anger and hurt feelings and brokenness. And um, that, that has been uh, part of the story of who I am uh, for my entire life uh, because of uh, the way that that went. Um, I mentioned divorce because this week's gospel uh, has some content about divorce. And uh, the following preparing for Sunday is much more a topical preparation than a textual one. What I mean by those two differences is, is I'm much more focused on that word divorce uh, than I am, I think, what the idea of the gospel is about. Um, I'll, I'll overlap this, but the Sermon Sunday is going to be more about the sort of theme that I think Jesus is working towards, and divorce becomes a, a, a road to get to that place. Uh, I'm much more talking about the topic of divorce here. Uh, and so I'm actually in the sermon Sunday going to redirect people back to this video if this is uh, a topic that they want to think about, if it's had uh, an impact or if they've thought about it or if it's had any bearing on their life like it has with mine. Um, the, the one thing I'll do to enter into this text is say uh, this, this, uh, this reading that we're going to get this week used to be a... a, a um, part of the litany of scripture that was used to talk about divorce. Uh, a big change has happened in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years, over the course of my life, where the idea of this being a text about divorce has changed now, where this is more used as a text to define what marriage is supposed to look like. Because of uh, changes in the world around us, because of the emphasis on things like homosexuality and openly gay folks and gay marriage, uh, this has pivoted from a text about divorce, which is the breaking up of marriages, to becoming a text about what marriage is. Uh, and that's just one way that we uh, are sort of revolve around God's word and use it differently over time. So good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Preparing for Sunday, where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday's gospel, the scripture text, this is for Sunday, October 6, 2024. This is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, and the text is Mark 10, 2 through 16. So as far as the lectionary goes, we are reading concurrently. This is um, uh, essentially back-to-back -back with last week's reading, where it concludes, where it lets off. Um, one of the things to note about uh, last week, I said this in the sermon, uh, I'll, I'll emphasize it again here. It, it's a good idea to not pay attention, per se, to chapter and verse headings. Because remember, last week's was string of pearls. They were ideas set next to each other that may or may not completely fit together. This week, with the divorce topic, and then with the part about gathering little children, continues that process of just being uh, a sort of compendium of things Jesus did and said, they're not really perfectly fit into the narrative. They're just strings. They're just pearls on a string. Like, hey, we got well, Jesus said this. It's important. We got to fit this in the story. So let's just do it. It's almost like a montage. Um, and so that continues here. And that should influence, in some ways, the way that we look at and think about this scripture. Again, this is topical. And again, during the sermon Sunday, when people hear the word divorce, they may or may not want more content on it. So I'm going to try to, even in the sermon itself, say, hey, here's where you go if you want more content on that topic. And this should be where you landed. Uh, this is preparing for Sunday. And uh, instead of being about the text, really, it's more about the topic uh, that comes up in this week's text. And that comes up through this word divorce. So, so what follows is a look at that. Um, the main scriptural background for divorce is found in Deuteronomy. So the five, first five books of the Bible are the Pentateuch, they're the important ones of the Hebrew Bible. The fifth book, so it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then the fifth is Deuteronomy. The fifth there, Deuteronomy, is really the law book. 
it's the church's or, or the Hebrew church. It's the Jewish folks law book, like rules, uh, a lot of that and a lot of uh, um, groundwork for, for rules. And so if you're looking at a rule for what to do in divorce, it shouldn't be surprising that you land back in Deuteronomy. And the important text here is Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4. Um, suppose, and I'm reading from that now. Suppose a man enters into marriage with a woman. You can see here already that this is a patriarchal society. The man is who's being addressed here. This was written by men. It's about men. Women are lower on that chain. That's an important tidbit to stick a pin in because that's going to reflect the way Mark is structured when I finally land back in Mark talking about this topic of, of divorce. So suppose a man enters into a marriage with a woman. So it's, it's not saying suppose a man and a woman fall in love or suppose a woman wants to marry a man. It's coming at this from this direction, right? And then it says, but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. She then leaves his house. So that's 24, that's Deuteronomy 24.1. There's a few more verses about this. Uh, right there, you're already going to see, though, a couple of other things. Patriarchal, that, that men are the ones that are being con concerned. Our world now, and I think for the better, it has a different interest in both children and women than this text had. So there's already that. Second of all, that the certificate it can be handed, that a divorce can happen, is assumed. There is no talk here of thou shalt not divorce. Remember, the Ten Commandments are concerned with adultery, not divorce. They don't say thou shalt not divorce. They say thou shalt not commit adultery. So there's another thing here that's, that's going on. The third thing here that's going on is the Deuteronomy text says he finds something objectionable about her. What are the grounds for, for him handing the certificate? In Deuteronomy, it's always him handing it to her. What are the grounds? Something objectionable is the English translation of the Hebrew there. Something objectionable then has been debated and argued and, and uh, this is one of the most talked about pieces of Jewish Midrash and Mishnah. So Jews and, and rabbis wrote a lot of additional books. They would read this and then write more rules about uh, what they thought it was trying to say. This is one of the most written about things in all of uh, Mishnah and all of Midrash. What is objectionable? By Jesus' day, the idea of what is objectionable was being debated, right? And it's a hot topic in Jesus' world. It's why he's approached in Mark and tested with this topic. And it really, it's a test. My life has, has had divorce as is a, part, a big part of the tapestry of it. And this topic now is big for me. It's still ongoing in our world. It was on, it was a big one in Jesus' world, and it goes all the way back to the to the world of Moses and in the early Hebrews. And men are allowed to divorce. Adultery is what they're worried about. They're worried about purity. They're not worried about what happens. And I hate to tell you this or say it this way: women and families are an issue of property and land. They're worried about the property and the land more than they're worried about the person. They're not worried about what happens to the children or what happens to the wives so much as they're worried about ritual purity, so adultery, or as much as they're worried about property. Who's going to get to keep the property that's being passed or, or shared in a marriage? This is, all, this is what you're unpacking when you go back to the Old Testament. You're unpacking... If the word divorce is an iceberg, it's it's that little bit is above the water and it goes unfathomably deep underneath the water. And so now we're plunging down into this and this is the foundational text for, for Hebrew people, Deuteronomy 24. And it continues uh, that then she goes off to become another man's wife. Again, the perspective there is about men sort of having all the property rights, having all the say, and women sort of in, in flux here. Um, which is different than our world. So you have to be careful when you're applying this. It doesn't mean it's not God's word. 
it means that there's a lot of transposing to do when you take this text and start talking about people today or in Jesus' day. Um, then suppose the second man dislikes or writes a bill of divorce and puts it in her hand. So we're saying that divorce happened. It can, men are allowed to do it. It was common. It was so common that people would get married once, twice, three times because it's addressing it like that. And from here, from Deuteronomy 24, it goes on to talk about wh what can happen with remarriages and purity. And it's basically a matter of when adultery happens. And so what they're talking about and what Deuteronomy is worried about, Deuteronomy is priestly. It is worried about purity. Hebrews and Jewish folks had an obsession with purity. They did not want any two things. You know, why are cloven hoofs bad? Because they're in two. Why is this bad where a woman is married, uh, is united to one man and then becomes united to another? They don't want any further uniting with the first because it's two. It's, it's breaking. They, they want things to be very pure. They, don't, they want it to be black and white. They don't want it to be uh, mixed. And so they saw their job as clarity uh, on adultery. And so that's what they're trying to do when they plunge into this divorce thing. Never in Deuteronomy is it forbidden. As a matter of fact, it's kind of taken for granted, right? So this then becomes uh, this text that's talked about. The thing that's talked about is something objectionable. What we want to get to is what's the allowed cause for divorce to be permitted, at least in the purview of the Bible. That word has never been understood well. It's been talked about for so long because we don't know where to put the standard for what's objectionable and what isn't. To this day, what's objectionable to me and what's objectionable to you, what I can sit in and what you can sit in, what Kate, my wife, can sit in and what I can sit in are different. What's objectionable is different. One of the things here that's that's uh, been talked about a lot is that that word, something objectionable, has this subtext in the translation. It's very close in translation to the Hebrew word for nakedness. And so again, it's rooted in sex, it's rooted in sexuality, and more than anything, it's rooted in, uh, um, it's rooted in uh, adultery, and that's what's important for people here. They're worried about uh, sexual morals, and divorce is seen through that lens. Women and children are also being seen through the lens of property that moves. When marriages happened, property would move uh, with any children that would be born from that marriage. Uh, so a lot of what's at risk here is class, is uh, the accruing of, of uh, well-being, land, uh, and then purity in terms of adultery, right? So, so it's clear here that Deuteronomy, which uh, means Moses, the law, permitted divorce. In, in Mark, in, which is the gospel for this week, Mark 10, uh, it says that Jesus is tested about the permission of divorce. And then Jesus' answer is, what did Moses command? Well, Moses didn't command anything. So there's an interesting uh, word that I don't know that I can wrap my mind around in Mark 10. Jesus, when he's tested, He's being put on the topic of divorce as a hot button thing just to see if you agree with him or not. Just like today, we would put somebody on it with, with trans issues or with openly gay issues or we, we like to hot button people. Jesus is being hot buttoned on divorce. And then he says that Moses commanded divorce and that's not true. So I don't know that I understand exactly what's going on here. Moses didn't write Deuteronomy, first of all. Moses is the voice of Deuteronomy. It's like the power behind it. And he didn't command it. It just sort of permitted it. And it did make commands about uh, adultery and about how it could happen. Moses never prevented divorce. And so there's a big one. You know, I, as a child of divorce, I, I was literally told at times in some real conservative church circles uh, that, that I was uh, uh, very sinful just because my parents divorced, which is crazy. I, I, you know, I was one or something like when this happened. Uh, and, and so it then became this law, this heavy, like, you need to be purified of that. And you can never be purified. I mean, I can never go back 
and undo anything. I might even conjecture to their horror that my parents being divorced might have been better for me and for them in the long run. It's had some ramifications throughout my whole life, but it may have been better. And so, boy, you know, there's just um, a lot about my well-being and the well-being of people wrapped up in this. And it's a different conversation now than it was for Jesus and that it was back in Deuteronomy. By Jesus' day, there were, and we know this from a lot of sort of extra biblical writing, we have a lot of text from the world Jesus lived in. Jesus is, is living in a world of text. As the Old Testament was sort of a oral tradition, Jesus' world is text. And so they are beginning to write, write and, and scribes and Pharisees and, and written records of things. And so we have a lot of these uh, now. And so we know that one of the big things that was going on in Jesus' world, we know this from sources beyond the Bible, uh, was, was two rabbis, Hillel and Shammah. So two rabbis became representatives of two different schools on divorce. Neither of them denied the possibility. Neither of them said you shall not get divorced. But both of them then represented inside that camp the Jewish tradition. Um, uh, one was pretty liberal, and that's the Hillel school. He would say something like, if your wife burns the bread, that's objectionable and you can divorce her. He's pretty progressive on how low the bar, how easy it is for divorce. Now note, at this time, it still wasn't like wives can allow, can, can enter into this, though that was becoming much more part of the picture. So for Jewish background, even though the, the, they never said you can't do it, they get into two schools, one's more progressive and one's more conservative. They're debating what that objectionable thing is. And the Hillel school says, you know, you can, she can look at you funny and you can do it. Still, it's patriarchal. It's patriarchal. Uh, it's through the male making the decision. Uh, the Shema school was much more conservative and they're interested in whether it's cheating. It's, it's uh, adultery. They're, that's the only thing that they thought would make it permissible. They're interested in that, that close association of objectionable to the word nudity. They're, they're interested in uh, purity, adultery, like the Ten Commandments. Uh, Hillel is much more progressive. Like, hey, if this just isn't working out because you don't like the way she cooks, you could, you could do this. Uh, Shema is much more conservative. It has to be immor immorality. Jesus follows the Jewish conservative road on this debate. He's not progressive like Hillel. So in Matthew 19, he, he, he says, you know, divorce is, is permitted. That's all the Jew, Jewish camp falls under that because Deuteronomy falls under that. But he says it's not for burning meals. It's for immorality only. And that's in the 19th chapter of Matthew. So he's allowing it. He's staying fairly patriarchal, but he's making it on a hard, harder ground where it has to be cheating only. This has come into some of our mindset where like, you know, someone gets divorced. Well, was he cheating? Was she cheating? Because that's really the only way that it's severe enough to do it. Um, that, that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew 19. And he's following the Shema school of Midrash. It's more conservative. In Mark, in Mark 10, we get Mark's telling of the same uh, uh, vein of Jesus talking. Only in Mark are we, said, are we told that this is a test of the Pharisee. It's a test of the law. They're trying to test whether he's in the Hillel school or the Shema school because they're trying to get some of his audience. Jesus is now being followed by crowds for, for what he's saying he's, he, he is, that he's God's son, and for the miracles he's performing. And they are trying to get, knock some of his votes off the line here by making him pick a school. Let's say it's half and half. I don't know what it was, and, but let's say it's half Hillel and half Shema. They're trying to get him to pick one so that the other half of people will stop following him and he'll lose his power and influence. Jesus clearly comes down on the Shema, the conservative side of divorce. There's, there's Jesus in the gospel saying, I have not come to abolish the law, 
but to fulfill the law. He, 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 and in this sense, it is very true. Although he sits with prostitutes and tax collectors and they say you're, and he heals on the Sabbath and they're saying, boy, you break all these rules. Here, he's, he's sticking to the rules more conservatively. He, in Matthew, he clearly says immorality is the only place that allows for divorce. The, that, that to our day comes down to John, you're a child of divorce. Was your divorce a product of, of, of that or just people not liking each other? I think mine was much more a product of people not liking each other uh, than they thought maybe they would. They did. Um, so, oh, that, that's the sinfulness. Like, they're clearly being more Hillel than Shema, and Jesus was Shema, and so you're clearly not where God would want you to be. Again, I didn't have anything to do with this decision, but, but that's sort of the uh, undergirded things of what I'm being told as a kid about divorce. Jesus is definitely Shema. And then Mark makes it even more conservative, if that's even possible. Uh, what, what God has put together, let no, let no person undermine. Uh, so, so if Shema is conservative, and if Jesus is picking that camp, he's even more, he's so conservative that the disciples kind of here and thereafter and these almost make it sound like they would, they're like, boy, you're so strict on that. We'd be better off if we never got married. And, and, uh, because you know, it's, it's so strict that, you know, uh, um, we, we can never accomplish that uh, because divorce was a somewhat uh, known part of their world and Jesus is tightening the noose on what all, what's allowable for divorce. Now, I said earlier that this text has become a text that's used to talk about the badness of divorce and it is pivoted into talking about the parameters of what's marriage because as we talk about um, people wanting to be married who are same-sex marriages or whatever, we have now, as Christians, a lot pivoted from um, using this to, to go at divorce to, to using this to go at the building up or the sanctity of marriage. It isn't really totally about either of those things. Jesus is more addressing the test than he is the point. And so the sermon Sunday, that's why I'm not even going to talk about the word divorce, really. Because what Jesus is really doing, teaching, and trying to um, disciple us in is how we approach tests and what we do. Uh, he is talking about divorce and marriage, and that's why I'm doing it in preparing for Sunday. I'm not avoiding that topic, but there's two things going on where Jesus is uh, dealing with a test and he's also and how to read the law in general and he's on a topic about that i'm doing the topic here and i'll do more like the general test and in, in how we read between law and grace later as the sermon jesus is making it seem much more law like heavy um uh, what god has put together let no one separate so if if you've made an oath you can't break it and he doesn't here in Mark give parameters for what would allow it to be broken. To be honest, Jesus is going may, way more into the camp of those people who talked to me when I was a kid and were basically like, you know, and Pete, divorce is bad. They were bad. You're bad. Uh, he, he's way closer to that. And, and that doesn't put me off. Uh, it just it is a history and a thing to think about. Uh, this is law and law always gets us the law does not save us. It drives us back to God. And so this is law, and Jesus is not trying to save us with it. He's trying to attack us with it. And when he says, what God puts together, let no one separate, uh, um, we separate relationships all the time. And so now we're getting into a real complexity, and, and we're getting into two separate issues. The relationships that God has put together, that we all the time separate, like, uh, and, and our sinfulness shouldn't be yelling at other people because their parents got divorced. It should be uh, uh, considering what we need to do to be good at relationships. Uh, being the lawgiver who gets to yell at other people does not always benefit a relationship. Um, so, so this is a lot of what's going on here in this text. The Bible has other texts that hint about, provide insight into divorce. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 
uh, 28 and 29, it talks about divorce. There, if you were to look that up, you will see how patriarchal and property-driven divorce is. It's all about property and, and about men. Um, so that's Deuteronomy 22, 28 through 29. That is not cited here by Jesus. It's just further background. Malachi, the last book of the Hebrew Bible, Malachi chapter 2, 13 through 16, talks about um, divorce. Uh, it's Malachi 2, 13 through 16. This one's different because it flips the script. In it, men are, are committing adultery. Now, the undertone of Malachi 2 is this is the priest's, the Malachi is the priest's perspective talking about the government of his day. And he's basically accusing government leaders of immorality. And, and he's talking about cheating and by being immoral, it makes you not able to, to put God first. Um, so there's some interesting context. The interesting thing there is, is that it's talking about the immorality, but by the time of Malachi, which is the end of the Hebrew Bible, as opposed to Deuteronomy, that's of the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, um, it's flipped over now to being like, well, men can do this too, and you shouldn't do it. Um, in the New Testament, in Mark, geez, John the Baptist gets beheaded for talking about Herod's immorality in terms of marriage divorce, cheating. John the Baptist is making statements about Herod's uh, promiscuous and, and very progressive use of the rules that, that he gets to do because he's a king that no one else would get to do. And he's beheaded for exposing it. That's similar to how Malachi speaks. And then, you know, the, you know that, te that what John tests Herod with, he uses the word lawful, which is similar to what Jesus says in Mark 10. So the context in Mark is, is uh, got some political undertones to it. People hate it. But what we're talking about is people who make rules and say everybody else is bad because they have to follow the rules, and then they themselves don't follow the rules very well. So Malachi is an interesting study, and there's a lot to talk about there, and I'm sort of blowing quickly past it. But um, the book of Hosea in the Old Testament also talks about immorality. Uh, Hosea is married to a prostitute who is still practicing prostitution. That is used in the book of Hosea as a symbol of God's people and our inability to stay faithful to God. So now marriage immorality is being commanded on Hosea. He's in a marriage that immorality's happened and he's not supposed to divorce her. So now there's more stuff here about divorce. Into the New Testament, we have some writings of Paul that are focused on quite a bit, that are focused on for sex, then they become a same-sex uh, or, or a heterosexual conversation. They're focused on for marriage. Uh, we can see that in 1 Corinthians 6.16. Uh, you know, don't be unified uh, with a prostitute, because when you are, you become unified with, with all that a prostitute stands for. What we lose there is, in, in Paul's world, prostitution was part of uh, Roman temple worship. And so what, what was happening is, is people were going to temples where to have access to the Roman Greek system of gods, they would, uh, do, they would drink, they would participate in orgies and other sexual things with, with uh, both male and female prostitutes. And so Paul is saying, don't be, don't uh, have, don't delay with one of them because you're being led astray from who God is and, and how God communicates. And, and, and again, then it's a purity discussion. In, it's important to note that in Jesus' world, while the Jews and the Hebrews allowed divorce, a man could do it. And then Hillel and Shema in that school were talking about whether to do it really liberally or really conservatively. Roman in the Roman world, women could also file for divorce. And that was pushing back on what it meant to be Hebrew. If men are the only ones for Hebrews that can file for divorce, and now we live in a world and we're not all, we're kind of rubbing a lot of shoulders with, with Roman and Greek people here, um, uh, and they allow women to do it, it was sort of sneaking into Judaism too. Uh, you can see as late as Malachi where uh, men's cheating is not looked upon as good. Um, in, in Hosea, uh, Hosea is not permitted to, we're not led to divorce even though cheating is part of it. 
this laying and this sexual stuff in Mar in First Corinthians six sixteen is a ton to unpack. You cannot just proof text it on people. Um, but there's some of the background here uh, that has to do with, uh, because sex is involved in marriage, uh, has to do with marriage and divorce. The big one for Paul is 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 17, and that has to do with uh, unbelievers being married to believers. And again, that's similar to this laying with a prostitute. That has to do with being influenced by things other than God's word. So God's word sets a clear path for us, and people were having a hard time because they lived in a world like you and I do, where a lot of what's at work is contrary to God's word. And so Paul is trying to set a path through that, and he's saying that marriage can be a place where unbelievers come to know God better because of the testimony of one believing person in the family. This also has some immorality under law, underpinnings, because of uh, some of those other things that were worshipped, expected prostitution participation. So a lot going on there. Also, an extra-biblical book called Sirach is written and has a lot of content and sort of midrash about divorce. And if you wanted to Google Sirach and divorce, you could find that. Um, one of the big things here I've already talked about, and the sermon moves way more in this direction. The sermon is not going to spend much or any time on divorce. Uh, it's going to talk about the fact that this is a test. Is it lawful? That's the John the Baptist part that gets John the Baptist killed. To me, Jesus has the pressing issue on his head, uh, in his mind. His head is a pun, I guess, because of John the Baptist. Um, in his mind of the test. And the important, 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 very ultimately important thing here that's always forgotten is we read these verses about divorce we say chap, Mark chapter 10, we say verses 2 through 12, we read these verses and we forget what came before and we forget what came after. And that's why I'm saying abolish chapters and, and verses. After, immediately after this, Jesus brings a little one and, you know, and talks about caring for little ones. That that rides on this text right behind it never came into mind when the church would look at me and say you're a product of a sinful broken thing which isn't wrong but they're bombarding me with that and then they're saying um you know they're forgetting that right after that little ones are brought in and, and cared for jesus concern here is about caring for the vulnerable that's his concern when he sits with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners that's his concern in marriage and divorce if a woman or a man can be pushed off, there's some vulnerability to their emotions. There's some pain in their lives. And Jesus is concerned with that because pain is the thing that he meets us in and saves us from. And so his emphasis goes away from the law and on all this wasted sort of when is it right and when is it objectionable and when it isn't. And he goes into care of the person. Because meeting a person and saying, your pain is not forgotten. I meet you in the cross of your life with the cross of my pain. And I promise a resurrection. Jesus is making this about uh, um, care of people and vulnerability. And that's so lost on people and on the church. When we talk to people about divorce, I don't think we should just say, oh, divorce and make it a willy nilly thing. We should have wall and try to uphold marriages because we want to keep uh, people's vulnerability low. However, divorces happen. It's possible that my parents divorced and that was for the better. It's a cloud over my head. It has been for my entire life. It might have been death or, or way worse had it not happened. So, um, you know, a lot there. We're talking about the application of law and grace and how to know when to do which one. And we never get that all the way right. Jesus, though, is is doing this in a way that sets those two perfectly beside each other. Uh, I read here earlier this week that you don't learn to fly a plane by finishing by by uh, reading and then following through on the instructions for crash landings. You don't learn how to fly by practicing crash landings. Uh, so you don't learn how to be married by focusing on uh, divorce. And you don't learn how to be saved by focusing on the law. The law is supposed to tell you what to focus on. 
um, which is God's care in Christ for us. Uh, you don't you don't learn how to be married by by um, focusing on what all the things that go wrong and what not to do. There is a lot of depth to talk about here, and it's hard. And this is why we're church together, because we're supposed to sit in and set a good bar for each person on when a divorce is okay or when it isn't. We're talking about immorality, adultery, divorce, decision making. We're talking about external well-being. Um, I saw something that says that the change in living status is negative in divorce. Like people come out behind in divorce 73% of the time for women, 41% of the time for men, and um, all the time for kids, I would say. Um, so we're talking about vulnerability. Jesus is talking about his saving us, meeting us in vulnerable things, trying to limit the amount of them that happen, knowing that the law always means that vulnerability and brokenness is part of who we are and saving and building from that. As a child of divorce, I know what it is for this to be all about law. Jesus makes it 50% law. So you can't erase that divorce is a thing we should wrestle with. This is not a text per se that meant to be talking about same sex marriages. So let's not per se leap there quickly. There's not a lot of text that does, so we need to use this sum for that talk. We need to do that carefully, though. But this is about not increasing the brokenness that's already happened. The law tells us where brokenness is. It drives us to it. It tells us it shouldn't happen. Jesus saves from it. Often churches should do law. And, and do it well, where we tell people, hey, don't get divorced, it's gonna cause a lot of hurt. But, but also we should be places where when it's happened, we're filled with grace and we're filled with care. So the sermon's gonna go away from divorce, which is why I wanted to steer you towards this prolonged topical study of how the Bible works with it. If this is a thing that has piqued your interest, please contact me. I would talk to you more. Uh, divorce is a thing I have thought about. I've read the Bible a lot about it. I've prayed about it a lot. It's a thing I am interested in. I would, if it's a thing that piques your interest and you've come to this video, I would I would happily visit with you and, and hear what's going on in your life. Um, and, and, and you could hear what's going on in mine. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, the sermon isn't going to stay on this a lot. To me, it's not a great content for a sermon. It's a good content for, for a discussion and for a study and for a video, but uh, I'm not going to use it for the sermon. Uh, but I am going to direct people back to this video uh, because that it's not a topic to avoid. It's just a topic to be very prayerful and to stop acting like we have all the answers. This issue has gone to the beginning of the Bible and beyond even that. And it has been a big one all the way up until our day. Stop acting like we have the solution. Be sure that the solution is so much brokenness happens when we risk our hearts in relationships and in marriage. And that brokenness is the thing that God sets before God and, and meets us in Christ and says, that's the place where I'm going to bring you life. That's what a resurrection is. So stop acting like we have all the answers. Uh, help people through law and grace, but always know that Jesus alone is the, the one that meets us and brings us to full relationships. This is a, an in-depth study, a lot on divorce, some on Mark 10, uh, but uh, um, when we gather for Sunday, I'll kind of move away from this. Thanks for joining me. If you were directed this, to this because of divorce, uh, please feel free to, to reach out. I'd like to talk to you about it more. Um, I hope that you stay safe between now and Sunday. Thanks for joining me. I hope this was a, a thought-provoking, prayer-invoking uh, study, and uh, I hope you stay safe. Uh, value your relationships. Value your oaths and the promises that you've made. Value uh, the immorality and issues of, of sex and adultery and, and how to care for people. Value all those things and know that God loves you and God wants the best for you. Stay safe, and I'll see you soon.